Now, when he's, Terry started working as a pharmacist's apprentice in the 1950s, he built his, bought his first store in Brisbane's Bayside in 1958. In 1994, he founded the Terry White Chemist Group with his wife Rhonda, an organisation which became Australia's largest pharmacy franchise network, employing more than 10,000 people. Terry served as state member for Redcliffe from 1979 to 1989. He was Minister for Welfare Services as well as being leader of the Parliamentary Liberal Party. Terry is an officer of the Order of Australia, was named Queensland Father of the Year, is that right? And he's hard to keep it quiet. <laughs> he's an honorary life member of the Pharmacy Guild and is a member of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame. Uh, Terry's extensive community service includes co-founding the Australian Liver Foundation and he was the inaug inaugural chair of the Nudgee College Foundation. Welcome, Terry. We also have Ted O'Brien. And Ted, after finishing his undergraduate degree at UQ in the 1990s, I believe it was, Ted, uh, began an extensive business career, uh, that, which included stints across Australia and the Asia Pacific with Defiance and the Australian Rice Growers Cooperative. Spent more than 10 years with the global consulting firm Accenture. Was managing director of Barton Deacon, as well as his own, his own firm, Ted O'Brien Associates. His community roles have included being chairman of the Australian Republican Movement, Chair of the Advisory Board for Ronald McDonald House Charities in South East Queensland. He was an Advisory Board member for Queensland Catholic Education and more recently, he founded and chairs a local Sunshine Coast not-for-profit, Generation Innovation. I'm sure Ted might say a few words about that tonight as well. Uh, perhaps most famously, Ted contested the seat of Fairfax at the 2013 election, only to be pipped at the post by Clive Palmer by a mere 53 votes. <laughs> Ted then recontested the seat three years later, successfully becoming the federal member for Fairfax at the 2016 election. Please welcome Ted O'Brien. <laughs> and our final panellist tonight is Brenton Rickard. Brenton is a dual Olympic silver medalist, former holder of World, Commonwealth and Australian records over 50, 100 and 200 metres. He's won six World Championship medals, including gold in the 100 metre breaststroke in Rome in 2009 as well as being a member of the winning 4 by 100 metre medley relay team at Melbourne in 2007. Brent had won 19 national titles, was crowned the Australian Institute of Sport Athlete of the Year in 2009. He was also president of the Australian Swimmers Association for six years and spent close to 10 years as a member of that organisation's executive. After playing a role as an athlete ambassador for the Gold Coast 2018 Games, he started working for the organising committee in 2013. Brenton is now Manager of Sports Services for the Gold Coast 2018 Games, where he's responsible for the sports entries and the competition schedule. No pressure there, Brenton. <laughs> Please welcome Brenton Rickard. <laughs> I should also remember, mention that all of our panels tonight are nudgy old boys, so it's uh, <laughs> good to have you here. Uh, our panel discussion for this year explores the uncertainty of work. We don't want to keep it too formal. If at any point you want to put your hand up and ask a question, please do so. Um, and we've called our topic changing careers in changing times. Uh, many people now have more than one career and changes in technology as well as the economy are having an impact upon the demand for certain skills. A recent study showed that Australians on average can expect to have 17 employers between the time they leave school until they retire. Average job, job tenure is three years and four months. For under 25s, it's one year and eight months. In 1975, the average job tenure for over 45s was at least 10 years. And now, some 40 years later, that figure has dropped to just over six years. Is this pattern a result of people wanting to change jobs or being forced to change jobs? In essence, are these modern career trends a reflection of opportunity, necessity, or both. Now, as we've heard, our panellists have each had incredible careers, which have taken them on a variety of paths. So our opening question is, have your career changes been born out of necessity or a desire to explore new things? Who amongst our panel would like to take up that initial? Please, sure. Ted, a few words. For us to sit here or stand up or? Oh, whatever you like, yeah. Do we need the mic or not? Not no, that's no, that's all right. Just keep coming. Well, well, I think the first thing is just to acknowledge Mark, thank you, mate, and, and our Mr. President. Um, 
Nice to be your present, sir. The president's tweet nowadays, by the way, Hugh. You've got around on that one. Um, and, uh, and I'm sort of the, in some ways the odd one out here because um, with an Olympian, and you know, Terry really is an Olympian when it comes to the particularly business and politics. I'm sort of like this little loser who's sort of, you know, trying to make his way up. Um, the first question, though, I think, Mark, was um, um, whether or not changes have been by design or. Um, well, for me personally, it's probably like other people in this room, it's a, it's, it's a mix of everything. Um, where I am now, I suppose, because I'm in the federal parliament, uh, this has been an aspiration, and probably a long aspiration. And finally, I got here. So I feel as though what I'm doing today has been part of a long journey to get here. Um, but with that said, um, different jobs I had were partly by design, partly by flip. I missed out on jobs often because I stuffed up. I, I remember, just to crack a, a, a bad joke, um, Defiance Mills started off my, my business in it, and my cousin here, Paul, knows the business well. Um, I started off at Defiance after university, ended up living up in Taiwan, and was doing business there. And through another long story about which I bore you, the business sold. So at the time, I was trying to come, do I come back to Australia, or do I stay in Asia? And my heart ended up being set on working for, Coles, uh, for Coke or Pepsi. And I remember prepping on both companies. And I ended up getting interviews with both. And one ended up cancelling. So I had the other. Conference call, I was great guns. I was at my sales best. And of course, the, one of the end questions was, so well, why do you want to work with us? So I went into this raving thing about why Coke is the best. And there was just, I thought I was killing it until the end. And of course, you know what they said, you do know Ted, you're talking to Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I came back to Australia. <laughs> and, uh, and I ended up finding another job. Um, uh, I'm grateful for where I am now, but I have to say, um, uh, got hit a lot on the way. And, and Mark uh, kindly mentioned Clive Palmer, um, which again was a situation where worked really hard at trying to get elected into Parliament, and uh, Clive Palmer comes along. And, um, you know, hopefully you don't have more than one Clive Palmer in your life. Um, but he's, he's a big fella to take on. You know, it's a lot of money to take on, um, particularly then. Don't know how to go now. Um, and so that, again, was a bit of a setback. Um, but we stuck with it, and thankfully, um, the people up in my part of the world on the Sunny Coast elected me in my current role. So a bit of a mixed bag. I'd love to say it's a legend story, um, but it's not. But very delighted to be where I am. Brendan, oh, before I come to take you here, yeah. Terry, I'll, I'll ask you in a second. I just want to grab Brendan's uh, perspective. It's the it's the often told story of the transition of the sports person into the world of um, non-sport. Yeah, That's and and I mean I might be a bit of a sucker for punishment because you know I, I guess as an athlete it's inevitable. You can't be an elite athlete forever as much as you'd love to, to keep swimming or, or playing whatever sport you're playing till the end of your time. You know that physically it's just not uh, realistic. Um, but I think that also gives you an opportunity that you know at some stage it's going to end and therefore you, you start preparations for that time. I, I think the hard balance for athletes in particular um, is, is working out what that balance is between starting to look at what's next, but not losing your focus on what's in front of you on a day-to-day -day basis. Because I mean, as an athlete, that is your job, is to spend you know, pretty much 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doing what you need to do to be the best athlete you can be. Um, and it's funny because I am a sucker for punishment because it's the reality in my job now. With, with the Commonwealth Games, pretty much by the end of April, we're all out of the job again and we, we start looking and, and once again, you can see it already that people are starting to look at what's next. What do they want to do post games rather than going, all right, I've got six months to deliver a great, a great game right in front of me. Um, for me, and, and it's probably a little more athlete centric than um, purely career centric, but we always kind of talked about the, the three phases for us. That first phase is, is that preparation. It's what you do knowing that the end is coming and, and, and how you prepare yourself for that. And, for me, that was more about study, and, and although I left swimming without a whole lot of hands-on workforce experience, um, I had studied, but also 
there were things that sport could teach me that university couldn't, um, and, and certainly that put me in great stead when I did join the workforce. I think the second step is the actual decision to retire, um, and, and I think it's the sad thing about sport that often you don't get to choose to go out on your terms. Some people do, but in a, in a lot of cases, in the sport of swimming anyway, it's often injury or it's it's basically poor performance. You have a, a bad knee and fail to make the Olympic team or, or a major team and you're pretty much done. So uh, I did get to choose my, my exit from sport, but I think it's also, um, it's still probably not the way I wish it had gone down, but as I said, you don't really get to choose, but um, I've seen a lot of a lot of athletes make that decision rashly and regret it, or likewise be forced into that decision by by injury or or something out of their control, and once again never really come to terms with it. And I think the final stage for us as athletes, and it's once again, it's probably where you see the most people struggle with is just the adaptation of it. You know, as, as a swimmer, I probably spent 40 hours a week training one way or another, whether in a pool or a gym or somewhere else. Um, so it is effectively a full-time job, but it's not a full-time job hours. You don't show up and go to the office at eight and come home at five and, and think you, your day's done. It's, you know, it, it's three hours of pure focus, of pure physical exertion in the morning. You go home, you switch off, you relax, you go back in the afternoon and switch yourself back on and, and do it again. And so just that adaptation to a normal working life is hard enough. Um, but then I think you also see the psychological adaptation of, you know, elite sport is very much an in-crowd, out-crowd type of scenario. You're either in there with the team doing it day in, day out, doing the yards, or you're on the outside as a spectator looking in and you can't have that connection. You know, even a year after I retired, I quickly noticed that you're on the outside looking in, not, not part of that group anymore. Um, and, and I see a lot of people really struggle with that. So the other part of it is, is just coming to terms with that you might not do something as well as you've done swimming or your sport again in your life. And I, I've seen a lot of people really struggle with that and, and it takes them a long period of time to adapt to the fact. Now I'd like to think I'm pretty good at my job, but I'm certainly not gonna get given an Olympic silver medal tomorrow for it. That's just the reality of, of, of what we do. Um, but the sooner you learn to accept that and adapt to that, the sooner you, you actually find, hey, there, there's a lot of great things that I love about no longer being an athlete. I know that sounds weird. Um, I do miss certain aspects to it, but there is a thrill after doing it for 20 years to kind of be free of it and do some other things. So I guess that's kind of my story to this point. Um, but as I said, it's something that I'm going to have to face up to again in, in six months' time or seven months' time when they kind of wrap up the games and I, I move on to what's next. It's all on my go. Thank you, Brenton. And last but not least, Terry, please, uh, some insights from you. Well, I, I was very fortunate that um, I went to Nunchi College and uh, whilst I was there, I, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my life at that time because every other school I'd been to, I was always in the shit. And various, various <laughs> things. And um, so uh, I actually enrolled myself uh, without my uh, parents' permission and not realising their financial uh, circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then Brother Green rings my parents up. I've had this son of yours in here. So anyway, um, my father was a mechanic and uh, he funded uh, my education in Hutchie by building all the athletics uh, equipment around and he used to drive the, uh, the school bus and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, I love Nudgee. It was a wonderful, uh, privileged uh, opportunity I had in my life. And uh, so I was just mad on sport. The only reason I wanted to go to Nudgee was to play rugby. And uh, I wasn't that good at it, but we won three premierships in a row, I might just mention, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, I noticed we've run the premiership again this year, which is fantastic. But um, my best mate at Nudgee was the school captain, Tom McDonald. Tom was an amazing athlete. And uh, in those years, we used to do 100 yards. He could run 100 yards in 10 seconds flat. He was a champion uh, breakaway. Uh, he ran the GPS uh, 400 metres, and he never 
ever run a 400 metres or 440 yards in, those, ever in his life. I was supposed to run it, and I would have run about fifth. So he ran it, won a record time, held a record for about 10 years. But uh, cut the chase, we finished school, and I was hoping like hell I'd fail. Was, uh, was called senior there because all I wanted to do was come back and play sport at Nudge here. Uh, again, not realising the financial circumstances of my parents. And uh, anyway, uh, I passed remarkably. Anyway, cut to the, to the point about Tom McDonald being my best mate. I said, well, what are you going to do, Tommy? Because there was none of this career counselling. I'd left. I had no idea in the world what I was going to do. He said, I'm going to do pharmacy, it's not a bad game, you know. You go to the pharmacy college and then you work in the pharmacy and they pay you two pounds seventeen and six. So you get ten shillings in your pocket to live on and you give the rest to your parents and uh, whatever you can negotiate. So I did pharmacy because of uh, Tom McDonald and I'm forever grateful. <laughs> grateful. So the next thing in life was uh, talking about uh, Careers, the obvious thing was to uh, get attached to a, a senior pharmacist. So I couldn't find anybody to take me on. And so I rang up uh, Nudgy and spoke to Brother Gallagher, who was our science master, Moose as we call, call him, and said, Brother, uh, I can't get an apprenticeship. He said, Oh, there's a, the captain's school in 1946 was a pharmacist by the name of Bernie Shaw. I'll ring him up. So. He brings him up, I get this phone call back, go and see uh, Bernie Shaw next Monday, and that's how I got an apprenticeship. So, you know, that was the Nudgy uh, connection. So, uh, anyway, remarkably, he went straight through pharmacy, topped the year, to the surprise of everybody. Uh, it's the first time I've puffed my chest out of that, but, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, the next thing was to, to get into a pharmacy. So I bought the worst pharmacy in Australia in the worst location. Didn't have a clue, but it uh, seemed to be a good idea. It was at Woody Point, surrounded by a beautiful site. Magnificent. It's got a jetty and a uh, nice fishing area, but completely surrounded by water. And of course, nobody came to it. <laughs> so I finally worked out I was in the wrong location. So talking about change, you know, we made the decision from that day onwards, position, position, position was critical. So we moved into shopping centres and where people, people went. And uh, that was the beginning of the development of what is now the Terry White Group. Uh, following, following that, uh, we got about five or six pharmacies going, become a bit bored as it were. Where, but my wife Rhonda, I might add, uh, They've been married to for 56 years. That's the best decision I ever made. Because she made it with the captain. And uh, we decided that uh, it was the 70s, the Whitlam years, everything's gone mad. The interest rates got out of control. And the uh, whole economy was in, in uh, gone madness. You had that, you know, lunatic ministers uh, negotiating loans for the very sus Kemblani, the Kemblani effect. Uh, episode where uh, the, the Minister for Mines had negotiated a $4 billion loan tip in those years with no approval of the Treasury. So that, that was the madness of that, that era. So we went back to university and uh, I did a, uh, an arts degree with double majors in economics and public administration. That got me interested in, in, in politics and Rhonda went on and did organisational psychology. So that gave us another opportunity for us, another career. That was where the aspirations. My first career was being the, the local pharmacist, as it were, uh, thanks to Tom McDonald. And, um, and then we started to look at doing other things. So I streamed into, I'd always been interested in public affairs. I didn't come from a political family. But the Whitlam years politicised because I could see, you know, like the whole economy had got out of control, that, that was, it was just madness. And uh, so, cut to the chase, that opened up after being 
to the uni, I, I took, took a further interest in uh, and ended up in, in state politics, my period of temporary insanity. As much as I'm very proud of you, Ted. <laughs> uh, and uh, had, a, had a maverick career in state politics, as you might say, and uh, we, we took on um, the then the Jockey Peterson government over the corruption issue. I became leader of the Liberal Party and fought an election on corruption uh, because it was endemic, <coughs> systemic in the whole system. And I was a monumental failure. Got thrashed because I failed to communicate. And that's when I realised that politics really wasn't for me. I was good at running government departments and that sort of stuff. But in terms of being a political leader, I didn't have that skill set. And political leadership is a unique skill. And not many politicians, you know, really get it. And uh, you've got to be able to keep your own people on side and then you've got to proselytise your message through to the community. And I was more or less standing up there like some bloody academic saying this is bad and you know, this is the reason why we've got to do this and the, the electoral boundaries were, were 30,000 people in my electorate and half my colleagues had electorates with about eight to 10,000, so it was a bit unfair. <laughs> and uh, trying to uh, explain all these things. So anyway, uh, just to finish up on that point, that was my second career. And uh, post-politics, I didn't know what I was going to do. I woke up after the election in 1989. And uh, you know, when, you, when you're a politician and you lose an election, like, I know how you felt how I felt, you know, you've given it your best shot. But at least I, I've been there for 10 years and I've had a shot at the leadership and, uh, and, and the ministry. So from then onwards, uh, the great thing about politics, it taught me the importance of, of communication. And that if you want to get something across, you've got to be tenacious, you've got to persist, and you've got to keep telling them, you know, you've got to get the narrative right, as they say today and you keep talking about it until you are absolutely all shitless, saying much the same thing, and travelling around the country and addressing groups of pharmacists and getting them organised, because they're all independent buggers, you know, they're all own, you know, and they're great people, but they're, they're classic small business professional people. And to get them corralled is one hell of an effort. And I, I don't think if I'd had a I doubt if we could have ever got the business off the ground had I not, not had a stink in politics, because that's what you know taught me the importance of uh, communication. Thank you very much.